Hello, world. Welcome to the Mile High Fi Podcast. My name is Carl, and I'm here with... I'm Doug Cunnington. Yeah. What are we going to talk about today, Doug? So today is sort of a, a bit of an inspirational topic. I, I came up with this one, and it's about just starting something, doing something new. And we'll we'll get into some sort of tactical things, but in general, I'm talking about putting yourself out there and starting a a blog or a podcast or a YouTube channel, or if some social media is your thing, like doing that. And there's a lot of different areas we can go with this, but for me, it's been like really life-changing. In fact, we probably wouldn't be sitting here talking if I didn't put myself out there a few years ago and slowly, um, you know, sort of try new things. So... Yeah, that is true. I'm kind of curious to hear how you got started. I'll, I'll tell you about mine. I, I discovered fire and I thought it would be cool to document it in real time. And I thought it'd be cool to kind of share it with the world. It would keep me honest and it would allow me to hone my writing a little bit. So I, I started a blog and it's kind of taken over my life and gave me meaningful activity to do post fire. So how about you? What was your first side hustle and how did you get started with it? It was a blog as well and kind of parallels. Uh, In fact, roughly the same time frame, I think, is when you started your blog, but it was with entrepreneurship and affiliate marketing. So I started following a guy named Pat Flynn. He has a huge podcast called Smart Passive Income. So I followed along with his podcast and blog and like many people, right? We find someone who's helping us in some capacity, like you found Mr. Money Mustache and I found Smart Passive Income. We follow along in the path and we think, oh, I want to do that too. I want to also start a blog. And I think one area that worked for us was we were naive enough to think we could do it. Because if you actually step back and look how competitive and difficult it is to start a blog or start anything, it's really easy to talk yourself completely out of it, which I'm, you know, not a pessimist, but more of a realist. So if I would have actually thought about how difficult it was to have a successful blog, I maybe wouldn't have started. So do you, did you realize that it was a a thing that was maybe a little tough? And by what Doug is saying, he shouldn't be, uh, that shouldn't uninspire you because there are still many reasons to do this, but yeah. uh, So when I Found fire, I discovered Mr. Money Mustache and J.D. Roth, who was writing at Get Rich Slowly at the time and has since returned to that blog. But I remember thinking, I'm like, wow, there's there's two blogs about personal finance and fire. And I really had this thought. So this shows how ignorant I was. I'm like, there's probably room for a third one. I'll do it. And little did I know there were who knows how many, probably thousands at that time. And since then, it's probably 10x or or 100x because people see all the other people doing this and then they get the idea to do it too. But yeah, if I wasn't so ignorant then I might not have done it, but there's a lesson in that too. in that we both became successful at it despite not knowing what we didn't know, those unknown unknowns. Right. And I think the inspiring part is if we could do it, then almost anyone can probably pull it off. Cause we're, um, I'm not, uh, super accomplished or talented in any area at all. I mean, do you think you're kind of a badass in anything? <laughs> no, I don't think you are either. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Seriously. The, the point is y- you can come out of nowhere. People start new blogs or new podcasts or whatever all the time. And they sort of, you know, come out of nowhere. Usually, that coming out of nowhere and the overnight success is uh, preceded by a few years of working and figuring out how to do things, communicating better. And that's some of the the things that we're going to talk about. So even if you, if you look at how competitive certain markets might be uh, a podcast, I think there's something like a, a million podcasts out now. People are thinking, Hey, it's saturated. It's too late. I don't think so. I mean, people said blogging was saturated and new blogs start every day and become successful over time. But along the way, you learn a lot of things and there's some very um, you know, powerful areas. So we have a few reasons why you perhaps should look at starting something new. And again, we're sort of talking 
any of these platforms. So we started blogs, but I think YouTube is probably a pretty awesome opportunity these days. And I, Carl, I think it's, is it cool if we get into the, the whys and kind of launch into some of the other stuff here? Yeah, let's do it. The first one we have to learn something new. So right off the bat, no matter what you start, you will end up having to figure out the technology and some of the hurdles. So we're, we're doing this podcast and luckily I've gone through this before I've launched a couple podcasts. So I know the hosting, some of the WordPress plugins will need any of the, you know, little details. So I've done this before and that's really valuable because we don't have to figure it out from scratch and, and learn it again. I can just do it because I've done it before. Um, if you were doing a YouTube channel, you may have to learn about the video equipment, understand audio and why it's so important and uploading, editing some of those other details. So whatever you pick, there's going to be some fantastic skills that are going to pay off in the future. Even if, you know, some of the earlier podcasts that I did, they didn't amount to much. Maybe I did like 20 episodes uh, with a show with my wife, but I learned the mechanics. That was part of the the whole goal is to learn the mechanics of launching a podcast. So even if your endeavor doesn't turn out to be a successful one, you don't reach whatever you thought you were going to do, you at least learned some skills along the way. Yeah, there, there's a good point to that. You never know, even if the first thing doesn't work out, you never know when an opportunity is going to come along that will allow you to reapply those skills. Like Thinking on it now, my first blog was not 1,500 days which is what I write on now. It was about peer-to-peer -peer lending, and that kind of crapped out, became unpopular. But I was able to, once I found something to pivot to, once I found something that was more valuable that, that I wanted to write about, it was easy to pick up the keyboard again and get right back to it. And I've also helped out a lot of other people. My mother wanted to start a blog when my father was having health issues, so I was able to jump right back in there and help her. And besides that, just the value and the accomplishment that comes with learning something new. I, I think there's a lot of value in that that maybe is overlooked. You're using your brain, you're exercising your brain, and you're learning something that hopefully, again, you will be able to reapply and use in other parts of your life. And luckily, when you are starting something new, the even if the learning curve is sort of steep, there's a lot of new things and you get that sense of accomplishment even by learning very basic things like installing WordPress and getting your first post out there. Yeah, it's so cool to see you hit the publish button and then you go to your site and whoa, there's something there releasing your first podcast and seeing it on iTunes or whatever it is. Pretty yeah, cool. and, and it's just amazing. And it, like I said, it, it does feel good learning those easy things and of course, you add more complexity along the way. It's uh, it's always a challenge to master anything. It takes many years and many tens of, or ten thousand hours or more to you know master anything. So, all right, the next why you should start anything is to improve communication. So any of these things that we're talking about, there's some form of uh, an audience and passing of communication. It, it actually, it could even be a book, right? So whatever you're doing, you're probably, hopefully going to improve your communication, which of course will pay off in many different areas. So do you have any um, broad thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, well, for example, if your interest is writing, you're going to become, the best way to get better at writing is just to sit there and type shit out there on a keyboard. And I thought I was an okay writer. I, I was a bit of a hack. But I, I thought I was probably above average when I started. Not much better than average, but probably a little bit better than average. I could get the there, 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 right, which uh, a lot of people, still, a lot of full-grown adults can't <laughs> master that. But I look at some of the first things I, I wrote, like, oh, my God, this this is just shit. Like, this is crap. And I'm sure I'm still not nearly as good as someone who would write for the Wall Street Journal or New York Times, but I've... It, I've improved a lot. The other thing that came with a blog is people started asking me to public speak, which was weird. I never thought that would come out of it. So we've talked about how one of the my goals with this podcast, why we're sitting here right now, is for me to become a better communicator, a better speaker. But 
I've also had the opportunity to improve that through in-person events. And I know you have too. Uh, you've given talks at the HQ, our local co-working space, Mr. Mighty Mustache. And you've been invited to speak at Google, which is pretty incredible. I mean, that's got to be, especially in the realm of what you're doing, that's kind of the, <laughs> does it get any better than that? Right. Yeah. And I, I agree with your um, ideas there. Some of the early things that I have published uh, were just terrible. I mean, they were awful. And I, actually, as time has gone on, even after I you know published on the blog or did things for a little while, even when I go back to those, those are pretty bad. So the unfortunate thing is I'm pretty sure when I look at what I'm doing right now, where I think I'm doing a decent job, when I look at it in a few years, it's going to seem terrible then too. So it, I think that's part of the struggle. Like we're always trying to improve. And I'll, a quick note, uh, you have mentioned a couple of times that I was invited to speak at Google. And that that is true. I never actually spoke at Google. I was invited to speak at a conference, which was put together um, by a company called Ezoic and Google. And it was sort of Ezoic's pub intelligence conference. Unfortunately, it was scheduled for something like April of 2020. So it was canceled a few weeks ahead of time because of COVID and the quarantining. But I freaked out at that point. And speaking of communication, I... Um, I was like, okay, I got invited. I have to say yes. This is a great opportunity to speak anywhere. I was never invited for anything else in person. And I joined Toastmasters, went to a few meetings, which was good. I gave a couple uh, in-person speeches and then everything moved online. So I, I stopped basically going to the Toastmasters meeting because I, I can talk to a camera all, all day long. That, that's no big deal. But sitting with people watching you is a little more stressful. Sure. Does it still stress you out? I've seen you. Well, I, I guess I've only seen you speak in public once now, but you were very good. I, I thought. Oh, it thanks. Was a small audience, but does it stress you out? And in, in in a positive way, I think. If you know the talk that you're you're mentioning, I think there were maybe like fifteen, twenty people, more than I expected. I thought it would be about four, but a lot more people showed up. I don't like melt down, but I think it's the healthy nervousness, the anxiousness before you make a presentation. I'm okay with the stress. So I think it would just be a matter of like doing a little bit more. I think if the group was say 50, I may have a slightly different reaction um, or 150, maybe a, a little different or a thousand, right? You're about to do a, a thousand person um, presentation towards the end yeah. of the year, right? Yeah, dog, you're freaking me out <laughs> a, a little bit right now. Why well, I, I hear in some of those, the light shining at you are so bright that you can't even see the audience. Oh God, I'll be blind. I won't be able to see whatever <laughs> I have to look at. Shit. Yeah, you'll, you'll do fine. You'll do fine. All right. Next one on the list here is clarifying your thinking and your thoughts. We're doing that right now. So I'm sure you and I go through our day. We're uh, walking around outside. You're painting or doing some work around the house. And you're thinking about um, like, Last show's topic was automobiles and, and cars and transportation. And we may have some passing thoughts on it, but we're people and our brains are scattered. We're thinking all these random things all the time. And it's really not clear. So we may have a passing thought here or there. When you have to make a presentation, when you write a blog, when you are creating a podcast or a YouTube video, you have to clarify and hopefully have a cohesive piece of information that makes sense. It forces you to do it. Otherwise, we could just go about our day with a bunch of random thoughts that don't quite make sense. So whenever you're producing a piece of content, whatever the format, you have to clarify your thinking. It forces you to get it on paper or verbalize it in some fashion. Yeah, especially I noticed this both with these podcasts. I've never had a podcast with you, and this is only, what is this, number six? I've never had a podcast with you when I haven't learned something or I thought about something has it, where I've arrived at a different place as a result of our discussion. But I find the same thing in writing. I, I don't say this often, but uh, the purpose of my writing was for me, and it was for me to to get my thoughts together. And a lot of time I'll be thinking about something, and I'm not sure 
how I feel about whatever I'm going to write about. So I'll decide to write a post about it. And by the end of the post, I've kind of arrived at a solution. So it forces your brain to churn on this topic for an hour or two hours, or sometimes in my case, eight hours. And a lot of times you'll arrive at a better place and you'll know what the answer is. It's kind of magical when it happens. I've seen, uh, you know, very similar things. And if you don't have the, I guess, sort of deadline or thing forcing you to actually commit your thoughts to some final medium, luckily you could always change your thoughts, but at least it forces you to draw a line in the sand and put down what you think at that point in time. It's very cool. Yeah. It's amazing. If you're ever, uh, Writing is the other thing I'll say a little bit off topic, but it's therapeutic too. Sometimes I've str- struggled with stuff emotionally, and to just write it down is uh, I'll feel a lot happier and I'll feel better about whatever I've struggled with, and it's a lot cheaper than a therapist. Indeed, it is. And uh, yes, yeah, on on the tangent front, have you do you journal or when you're uh, actually I'll just mention what I do occasionally. Sometimes I'll get stressed out if I've committed to too many projects and I'm like, oh man, I'm kind of stuck. I'm not sure what to do. And just writing everything out, kind of journaling, kind of creating a list, I end up realizing, oh, it's fine. Like I just need to prioritize a couple things. Every Everything's cool. And once I get all those thoughts out of my head, then it frees yeah. my brain. Yeah. It gives your, I've had that exact same thing. And I think it's because it's giving your brain permission not to worry about this shit. Okay. I've got it all on paper. I can, I can move on when I'm done with this task. I can look at that and figure out what I'm going to do next. But yeah, it's uh it's liberating. I know just what you're talking about. Another reason why you should start something is it leads to opportunities. And those are really hard to plan for. In fact, if you tried to plan it, you pretty sure you wouldn't be able to do it. Usually there's some serendipity happening, some other things out of your control. But if you are putting yourself out there, people will contact you. You'll be able to make connections that you wouldn't have been able to before. And I've seen this so many times. I mean, again, this podcast is because I've blogged. I have podcast. I invited you on my show a couple of times. We had a, a nice time talking about it. And here we are recording a, a podcast of our own. So opportunities pop up that you have no clue are even possible and it could be years down the line. So I think you probably have a decent story around this. Yeah, I do have a good story. But one thing I want to say, I think you said something important there right at the end is you said it could be years down the line, which might be, uh, which might be, there's a couple of things I want to say about this that might be kind of uninspiring, but if you're doing these type of things, I think you should be doing them for yourself and it should be something you love, like you would do, even if you weren't paid for it, even if your goal is to get money. I think if I would have focused my blog on making money, I don't think it would have been successful because I don't think I would have let my voice come through. And regardless of how ridiculous my voice is, it resonates with certain people who come back and read my ridiculous shit every day or however often they come back. But it was a grind too. It took years for it to amount to anything, but it was just because I loved it and I would have done it for free and uh, I wasn't doing it to impress anything. But the opportunities thing is pretty interesting. Uh, I had a blog post where I wrote about how I gave a talk and I think it was just one of these campifies. These are these local events where the community gets, gets together and hangs out for a weekend. And then I get an email from this person. He's like, yeah, I work for the Sacramento Kings. Like, uh, I saw your thing online. Do you want to come speak to our organization? First, I'm like, holy shit, the Sacramento Kings. Like, I don't follow basketball, but I know they've got that. <laughs> Didn't they win the championship? I don't, I'm sorry, but NBA fans. We're, we're idiots. Yeah, we're, we don't <laughs> yeah. know. Yeah. And it turned out to be, he wanted me to come speak to their IT department. But that still would have been pretty cool that I come out to San, San where the hell are uh, Sacramento? <laughs> That's where the Sacramento Kings would be located. Sacramento. God damn it. But anyway, he's like, yeah, we'll put you up. You can talk to the IT organization. And then COVID happened and that never happened either. But maybe it'll happen in the future. But 
Yeah, the other things, uh, I was invited to speak at JL Collins Chautauqua, which is cool and an amazing experience. And also this thing you alluded to, a thousand people in November, which is crazy. And it never would have happened if I just wouldn't have wanted to put my ridiculous thoughts on this stupid blog. So, mm -hmm. And you're a co-owner at HQ as well. Like, would that have been possible if you didn't have your blog or no, I, is that... No, I don't think so. I'm trying to think how that directly relates, but uh, part of owning the co-working space is recruiting members and having a public presence uh, helps, uh, definitely helps get members there. So yeah, I don't think I would have been involved and I don't know if I would have known Pete that well. And I think just knowing him well uh, probably led him to thinking that I would be an okay partner, someone to partner with. Because if you're going to go into long-term business with someone, you better make sure you've got your priorities yeah. together or else it's going to not end well. Right, right. And I think it's also a, a bit of a tough sell, right? So opportunities in the future that you don't know what they might be, and it could be years down the line. Probably the best ones will be several years down the line. And I don't know what to tell people other than it, it is important if it's something that you would do anyway, that you're self-motivated with and that you're into. And if you just stick it out, probably something is going to pop up that is unexpected. Yeah, there, there's a great quote around this. And I just heard it yesterday. And I, I can't remember who said it, but the quote goes something like, it's funny how overnight success is, was followed by 15 years or was followed by 15 years of hard work. And it's true. You see these people like killing it, doing a really good job. And it's hard to be smooth on a podcast. I'm not smooth. And you don't really appreciate how difficult it is until you see someone who is really good at it or hear someone who's really good at it. But they worked at that shit for a long time. They just weren't naturally that good. Maybe some people are like that, but those people are unicorns. The people who are really good at whatever they do, they've put a shitload of time into it. I mean, you have to be okay with that. Yeah. Tons, tons of effort. Next is whatever it is you start could grow into something much bigger and potentially replace your full-time gig. And that's what happened with me. And you, you alluded to the fact that you didn't start your blog to earn money. You were sharing information. It, it was for you in a lot of ways. I started my blog literally to make money. So I wanted to sh share the story, but it was important for me to not do it as just sharing information, but to have, have a product. And uh, I suspect some people will think, ah, that's kind of a sleazy thing to do to start something and, and just want to make money. But I came from the entrepreneurship side. So it, it's silly to do something and not make money if you're from the entrepreneurship side. <laughs> so, and I respect people if, if they judge me for, for that, but I have been able to create a, you know, a, a great business, very lean. Uh, it's me and I have a couple assistants that do about five hours of work per week or so. And it's a multi six figure business. It has been for a few years. There's a few different areas and it's really fun. It's like the kind of work I want to do. So it can grow into something much bigger. And I thought, hey, it'd be cool just to have a, a blog and maybe make a couple hundred extra dollars per month. Yeah, that's cool. And you said sleazy. I don't know. Your OnlyFans page, that's that's sleazy. We'll get into that later. But SEO, I don't, there's nothing wrong with wanting to make money. Do you Did you find it hard to balance your desire to make money with doing what you really want to do? Like, has it ever felt like a job and this sucks and I don't want to do this anymore at this point, I'm just in it for the money. How, how do you find balance with that? That's a really good question. There are certain times when I have maybe overcommitted to certain uh, projects or too many projects and I find myself busier than I want to be. I haven't thought I want to quit. I don't like this anymore. Usually it's a a little sliver of the work that I don't enjoy. So for example, when I did get laid off in 2015, I wasn't making a full time income. It was just a side gig. I was probably making, you know, thousand, fifteen hundred dollars per month on the side. 
So when I got laid off, I needed to replace, you know, a six figure income basically. So I tried many different things. One of those was a service business and a service business uh, has clients and you have to, you know, work with the clients and sell. And it turns out I don't like working with clients so much. I'd rather work with uh, students in a capacity where I'm teaching. So I have courses instead. So I realized, oh, I really hate working with clients. I don't want to do this. And even though it was the most profitable area of the business at that time, I killed it because I was like, I I don't want to do it. This doesn't make me happy. I'm going to work on something else. So it has been sort of a cultivation of understanding what I want to work on, where I want to spend my time and how my values fit into that. So I I think that mostly answers the question, right? Yeah. And I've got one more follow-up question, I guess. This is something Mindy and I discuss frequently because she still works. So you say you like it, but is there an amount of money that you had like so you came into a bunch of money tomorrow that you would completely give it up or would you pivot? What would you do if you had all the money you would ever need to be perfectly comfortable for the rest of your life and then five times that, five X that, like yacht money? Uh, sure. I would, I would probably pivot a little bit. I like creating the podcast and I like um, the connection that I have with some of the audience and I do live streams every week. So I would probably do some portion of that. But yeah, if I had just complete F you money, I probably would dial back. Like I've, I've, I've been doing more ads on my podcast, which is totally fine. Like it helps my audience find the products that they want to use. Like I'm only working with the companies that I want to work with. And I tell them I want f- free creative control and I'll cuss during their ads or say whatever I want. Like there's, there's that, that's important to me, right? I don't want to completely sell out. Although I did recently, I can tell you about that a little bit. And uh, the point being, I would probably dial it back and just like chill the fuck out for a little while and maybe have a little sabbatical because I haven't really taken time off. It's really easy for me to just like get a little free time and then fill it up with other projects. And I actually need some time to be bored. And I haven't been super bored in in a while. I've been trying to do more like kind of like mini retreats where we, you know, go off to the mountains, kind of disconnect, only bring my laptop if there's some sort of a server meltdown situation where I need to like do something. But I think I'm going off on a big tangent. What was the question? No, I think I think there was a lot of wisdom in there. And, uh, no, the the question was how much money. Oh, the question was you mentioned f u money. Would you tell me to f u <laughs> tell this podcast to f u if you had f u money? And I think the answer is maybe. <laughs> but yeah, no, no, we we'd still yeah. I mean, I I enjoy chatting with you, so we would just. Uh, you know, maybe maybe record at your place so you show up on time for once. Whoa! No, I'm just, I'm just I, kidding. No, no, I, I was only one minute. I was still late. And is tardiness a binary? Th- I think it kind of is. Like it's a one or a zero. And I was late, but I showed up at nine thirty one. So I was yeah. only a minute late. The last time was half an hour. I know. You know the crazy thing though, because we we did uh, two episodes. This is all behind the curtains. We're having we're ha- this is like our first fight. I think. Yeah, kind you, of. The uh, today we recorded two episodes. So I'll I'll let you finish your drink there because you may spit up. We scheduled it at nine today. I scheduled it earlier. Oh, you did? Oh, shit. (laughs) So look back at the calendar. It's totally fine. I was 31 minutes late, but that's totally on me. I know how to work a fucking computer by now. God damn it. I I almost wasn't even going to tell you, but I thought if I do it, I should do it while we're recording. That would be the best. So this isn't a fight. This is me. (laughs) Me (laughs) being an idiot. It's fine, dude. So the, um, yeah, uh, what I was going to say is we could put the recording studio at your place so you'll never be late. That That's my, my big idea. Doug, right? I would still find a way to be late. Like I'd be out at Home Depot or some shit and I would still fuck it up somehow. Trust me. I, if, yeah, yeah. It knows my ways of fucking up. No, no yeah. bounds. So it, the really good question though, because I mean, uh, I think that's perhaps a topic we can get into. It's like, if you had unlimited money, what what would you do? I think you had a recent blog post and I don't want to spoil the whole thing, but yeah, it's very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. And I want to talk about, I want to save this for a little bit later when we talk about the actual gigs, but I want to talk about what you said about boredom because there's something really valuable in that that's lost on modern society. But so if I forget, please remind me about that. But we're now 
two bullet point six provides structure, meaning, and challenges. And yeah, that was a good segue, Doug, because this podcast apparently hasn't provided structure in my life because I can't find a way to conform to the structure, the, the time structure. So it does give me, even though it doesn't give me structure, it does give me meaning. And it's a good challenge to see if I can be as smooth as you, Doug, which, um, which I'm not. But I hope to be you, Doug, someday. Yeah. You're doing pretty good. You're doing pretty good. What, what do you think about structure, meaning, and challenges? Definitely. And I, we kind of talked about this in the happiness episode from a couple episodes back, but with reaching Phi, people sometimes are concerned about meaning and what they would do. And if you do start something, you can shape it to be exactly what you want, even if you're financially independent, you have FU money, you don't have to do a damn thing. If you at least have a little commitment yourself to do one podcast episode per month and just think about it and put something out there where you're thinking and processing information, communicating, pulling all this stuff together, you know, or, you know, we haven't talked about it much, but you could do Instagram and post something once a week and have a nice narrative or some, you know, something that you're sharing from your life. And I think having that meaning and having that structure, plus getting feedback. I mean, there's something nice, especially, you know, right now we're dealing with COVID. There's still some, depending on where you live, there's heavy quarantining. I talked to a friend in the UK and they, I mean, at least when I talked to him, he was like, yeah, everything's still closed but it's supposed to open up soon. Meanwhile, there's like parties and stuff going on around here, you know? Yep. So it's very different. But the the whole point being, th there has been a nice connection, especially for people that who are already working online, like myself, where quarantining wasn't that weird. I was already talking to people online and having those sort of uh, relationships. So overall, that structure, that meaning very nice and challenges. Um, like, like you said, you're having to come up with some ideas. We have to communicate and, and produce these shows. So, show up yeah. on time. Yes. Yeah, you yeah. got it. Well, one thing I want to mention to build on what you said is the timing of this. Uh, I guess people listening to this might say, when should I start this? And I would say the time to start it. If you're thinking about, living fire and stopping work all, altogether. I would suggest starting this while you have a job. One thing, I didn't start my blog for this reason, but the blog actually made leaving work much easier because I had something to transition to, something that gave my life meaning and, and challenge. So if I didn't have that, I'm not sure I would have quit. It's kind of like a maybe self-fulfilling prophecy, but maybe that's the wrong way to, the, the wrong terminology. But the blog about fire actually allowed me to achieve fire life because I think I would have been lost and very unhappy if I would have stopped working and had nothing to do that would have made me very unhappy. So start these hustles now. And the other thing is if they become successful, you never you, you never know if your thing takes off. Maybe that is the reason to quit work. Hey, I'm making as much money as I make at my job. I should just leave. What the hell am I staying at my job for? Mm -hmm. So start working on it early. Cultivate your passions and work on these hustles before before you need to. And I think it's important to start maybe before you think you're ready, because it's very easy to be a little scared to put yourself out there. It, actually, you, you probably should be, right? That's completely normal to think, hey, I, I don't want to put my thoughts out there. People may judge me. Guess what? They will. And you know you have arrived when you have trolls show up and they tell you you're an idiot and you know they, they disagree with you right? That's when you know you made it. So quick example, I created a, like a keyword research concept. I, I don't know. Did you get much into SEO? Do you know keyword research and some other things like that? Yeah. Mainly from you, but. Okay. <laughs> so, so you have a tainted view of the whole thing, but uh, the point is I created this concept keyword golden ratio. Cool name, right? Golden ratio, little uh, Fibonacci thing in there, yeah. right? It's unrelated to that. It has nothing to do with it. It's just a marketing name. Sure. So it caught on and it's a thing that is bigger than me now, right? So some people are aware of it that know me that didn't know that it was from me. So it's it's grown, grown a uh, 
its own ecosystem, really. And just side note, in fact, I didn't realize this, but I was on another podcast yesterday. I was telling the host, hey, if you go over to Fiverr and you look up keyword golden ratio, there's like nine pages of people doing services Whoa. for keyword golden ratio uh, research. It's weird, right? So I, what I comes get, up if you Google golden ratio? Uh, keyword golden ratio. Uh, it will be funny enough, a guest post that I wrote <laughs> on someone else's blog. And then my blog will come up and there's a bunch of YouTube videos on the topic. So all that to say, it's bigger than me. And at this point, there are people saying that it doesn't work, that it's a bad idea, that you shouldn't do it. So it's like sort of the typical um, maybe life cycle of an idea. So people didn't want to adopt it at first. Then people started using it. Then you end up with like clickbait style videos where it's like, don't use the keyword golden ratio. It's the worst idea ever. Like that, that sort of thing. So there's videos that just trash me um, to get views. Oh, but you know, you've made it then in kind of a backwards, shitty sort of way. It's great. And the fact is, <laughs> it's great. it took me a little while because at first, you know, you feel like, oh man, like why, why are you, I'm just a little guy. Why are they messing with me? But at the end of the day, it means that other people are thinking about me. So I went, I don't even know who the fuck they are. So they're, they're making videos about me and, and I don't know who they are. So do, I, I won. Do they ever put your picture in there? Do you ever watch them or you, you just ignore all that shit? Uh, you know what? I think, yeah, I haven't noticed anyone put my, uh, my picture on there, but if they wanted to, that'd be fine. Again, th they're thinking of me. They're looking at me. Yeah. Like any publicity is good publicity. And, uh, I don't know, the, the better mouse trap will, will win out. Some people might be lured by that crap but obviously you've provided if it's blowing up that big you've provided a lot of value so the trolls are full of shit and just trying to sell their own troll shit and to, to bring it back around because it's it's cool almost any point that you give me i could just talk about myself for about five minutes but it will be scary to put yourself out there people will judge you it's good to have thick skin about it just in general and it's probably a good skill to have thick skin so people don't bog you down, right? Yeah. So when you think about a lot of the concepts we've, we've talked about, I drive an old car and you have sort of an older, um, fairly economic vehicle. And uh, we don't care if people think uh, less of us because we're not driving a, a fancy, nice BMW. It doesn't bother us. Yeah, unfortunately, in this... In this scenario, in the negative world, and there are a lot of angry males, anonymous males sitting in basements willing to type out shit to try to uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to make you angry or upset. But we're kind of doomed in this way. But if you know a little bit about psychology and how the human brain works, you can overcome it. And what I'm referring here to is negativity bias. So you could have 100 people tell you how the golden ratio is the best thing ever and then like three people tell you it's a bunch of shit and how the mind works. And maybe yours doesn't work this way because you're, uh, you're, you're enlightened, but you tend to focus on the three negatives. So what you should do if anyone gives you this negative feedback or, or says some nasty thing is, is I would say one of two things. First, acknowledge the negativity bias and, and consider how many people you've helped and let that win out. And the second thing I would say is that I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, Doug, it'll come back to me in a second. Oh, yeah. If anyone is if anyone is really negative and nasty, especially the, the really negative people who aren't adding anything to the conversation, they have some issue going on with themselves, and it's really an issue with them and not with you, and they're just lashing out. And that's actually helped me a lot. Like, I think of that. I get some nasty comments occasionally, and what I've pivoted to doing is I'll respond to them saying, hey, it sounds like you might be going through some shit. Is there anything I can do to to, to help you? I don't... It doesn't seem like you're in a good place right now. And they usually don't respond back. In fact, they've never responded back, but yeah. maybe they'll shut their troll mouth at that point. And yeah. I am serious if they did respond back to me. Hey, there was one famous, uh, just a quick sidetrack. There was one famous case where this woman, I think she had a blog and her, her father died like at a young age. And this one awful person just wrote all this crap like, oh, it's better he's dead. And like, oh, like the worst, most vile shit you could possibly think of it. 
So she looked up the guy, found him, and I think confronted him in person. It's famous. It's all over the internet, this story. And he was apologetic and just pretty much acknowledged like he was a, a dick and he was going through this stuff and it really had nothing to do with her. It was all him. So people will be nasty, but try your best not to take it personally. And I'm going to look up the golden ratio, Doug. I'm pretty excited about this. I, I, I had no idea the things I learn about you every time we podcast. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm awesome. I'm awesome. Yeah, that's the big thing. <laughs> Final note on that. I, tr- I try to ignore a, a lot of the comments. In fact, I, I hardly respond back to comments on YouTube, even though that's one of the greatest things you could do is reply back to comments. But, you know, it's the internet and internet comments are bananas. So even if they're legit, I, I usually just stay out of there. One of the people that did one of those videos, one of those clickbait style videos, which was relatively respectful. They were just saying, hey, don't use the keyword golden ratio because of X. I want to work with other people. So I invited him onto my show and we just talked about it. We had a debate. I don't take it personally, right? I I don't care. Like I said, if someone's talking about and creating videos, talking about me specifically, that's good. So anyway, I invited him on the show and I'd rather have uh, competitors, uh, peers, everyone. It's like uh, the rising tide lifts all ships or whatever. So I was like, sure, man, come on my show. Let's talk about it. Let's have a debate. Like we don't have to have like videos that are going like back and forth. Like kids or something like that. Sure. Yeah. So we had a, we had a nice show and, um, actually I read some of the comments there and people said, Oh, it's really great that you did that and had like a difficult conversation. Yeah. Most people would just, you know, not even try. So, all right. I think that, uh, covers it for the why I'll do a quick recap. We have a couple other notes. So start something because you'll learn something new, improve communication, clarify your thoughts it will probably lead to opportunity sometime in the future. It could grow into something much bigger than what you expected, maybe even replace your full-time income. And it provides structure, meaning, and challenges post-fi, which is important. You don't want to, you know, just have nothing to do and a, you know, a bunch of money (laughs) just sitting around. Now, before we kind of pepper in some other thoughts here, you can join the Mile High Fi Club at milehighfi.club. That's our email list where we share some of the uh, things we're thinking about, maybe some products we're into, books we're reading. I thought it could be cool to put some quotes in there too, like quotes that we come across Ooh. during the week. Yeah, that's a great one. I don't have any fresh off the <laughs> off the top of my head. That would have been really, really good, but it's an email and we'll let you know whenever we're putting out new uh, episodes and some of those other things that we're into that week. So that is milehighfi.club. All right. And uh, honestly, as I'm looking at the rest of our outline here, I I can't remember um, what else we're supposed to say here. I know I wrote part of this and I can't remember what you added. So this is all behind the scenes stuff that we're just going to publish out there. (laughs) What could possibly go wrong? (laughs) Maybe that could be our quote. Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Scott Adams uh, concept of finding, uh, I don't remember what the context of this was, but you mentioned it last week and we were both familiar with it. So Scott Adams gives some career advice and it is very generally don't focus on something you want to be an expert on. If you want to be, uh, I'll go through a couple of examples. If you want to, if you think you're good at basketball, you're probably never going to be an NBA player. If you're a good Musician, you're probably never going to be better than than yo 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 than yo yo ma. Can I put an extra yo on there? So you shouldn't focus on on one thing and try to become the expert in that because there's always going to be someone better than you. Especially golden ratio. Don't go don't <laughs> go anywhere close to that. So what Scott Adams recommended you do is find two or three things that you think you're pretty good at, above average, and combining those into a skill. And for me, that that became the blog because I enjoyed writing. I thought I was slightly above average in that. I like talking about money. And if I think long and hard, I can come up with some good fart humor. So you combine those three things and all of a sudden you're doing something that no one has done before that you enjoy doing. And most of all, you're leveraging your existing strengths. You're not trying to be the best in anything. I doubt there's anyone trying to write about finances and fart humor. Uh, Yeah. And I found a niche for myself there too, but I'm sure you found a lot of 
of that with what you do too, Doug. Right. And it, it is uh, called talent stacking, talent stacking. And I think Scott Adams, he's the Dilbert guy. Did you mention that? The, the no, Dilbert. I yeah. did not. Yeah. Dilbert. So and I, I, I love Dilbert when he, when it first came out, like in the you know mid late nineties yeah, or so. Great. And we were, it's funny, we were both, uh, you know, starting or getting into our careers of, you know, being engineers sitting around behind lap or laptops and computers and in cubicles and, um, realized that it wasn't, wasn't really for us, but Scott Adams has a book called how to fail at almost everything and still win big. And it is sort of a memoir of him and then how he stack these talents together. So the Dilbert cartoon is not like beautiful artistry, right? It's a pretty basic sort of the same characters all the time. I guess that's what comics are, but he, he's not a fantastic artist. He's not necessarily a, a like top 5% um, public speaker. He maybe isn't the best writer, but he's written several books. He's paid a lot of money to go around and speak. And he has a comic that's syndicated across the world. So what he, the whole thesis is what you said. So you might be pretty good at a few things. Maybe you're uh, average at say five or six things, but you put them all together. It's a unique combination that comes together. And maybe you're one of the few people in the world that can do those things. So it's more unique. So for me personally, I have mentioned that I'm not a top performer. I'm not really that good at many things, but I was an okay project manager. I got my PMP. I understand code a little bit. I don't think I was a good writer, but I work at things pretty long term. And for me, editing has been like the, the biggest difference difference, right? Just editing and more refinement. So over time, I've become better and put this sort of project management spin on some SEO. Like I didn't know SEO or affiliate marketing before I got started in 2013, but within a couple of years, I was you know, probably very proficient to maybe expert level. So put together project management with affiliate marketing, that's sort of what has allowed me to create my courses and put my own unique spin because project managers in software typically make pretty good money. So they're probably not going to leave, start again from ground zero and learn affiliate marketing and SEO. They're usually going to stick with their six figure job doing project management. So with my little niche that I've carved out, just like you, I'm using the language that engineers and software and IT people use, I'm doing affiliate marketing and I'm framing it all in that way. So it's like the only, to my knowledge, it's the, I'm the only PMP doing this kind of stuff. So there's a lot of people in the old IT world that hate their job and they want to do side hustle. So it's like a perfect market fit and I couldn't have planned for it yeah. at all. It was just like over time adding things and I've done the blog now podcasting, now YouTube. So I have this like sort of interesting skill set that's a little bit different. Yeah, it's interesting to hear how it's evolved too. It started in one place and you've kind of, especially right now, what we're doing now, it's kind of arrived at a different place, but the skills that you built helped you do this. And even if they weren't directly related, I'm sure some of the technical stuff you did give, gave you confidence to do something that might've been completely different, but knowing some of the, the tech knobs to turn, um, helped you or gave you the confidence to at least start something that was not so related. Now, yeah. you're really good at brewing beer. I can't. I was trying to figure out if there's any Venn diagram overlap to what you just said, and I haven't thought of any. But um, if it comes to me, I, I think you would just knock it out of the park if you could find <laughs> some way to integrate your your Belgian quads with with uh, everything else. Yeah. I, I It's interesting you mentioned that because it's like, oh, how, how can you fold that into it? And I think the best way is just to drink while I'm working. That's about the only practical way. It turns out a brewery is just so expensive to run like all the equipment and like all the regulations. And I can't, I can't, um, I, I don't want to sign up and have like a, a whole team of people and ha I, I don't know, but I, I have thought like, how can I fit this piece in? But I, I do like a lean team. 
it's like lower responsibility than actually running a brewery. I know you weren't suggesting that specifically, but some people have asked, like, why don't you start a brewery? No, but there's something to be said for that too. If you're really good at beer and don't want to be involved in all that other shit, maybe if a friend started up a brewery, maybe you would be willing to consult on a very, very small basis. I can come in there and do this one niche thing. I can advise you on on how to brew this one type of beer and what you might want to do with your equipment. So there still might be a way to to leverage what you do, but not let it take over your life. I've thought about a brewery too. I've had, I've talked to people about that and uh, I don't, I don't want another job. It's yeah. There's a, there's a lot of work now. I think, was it in this episode that we were, you, you said, Hey, if you had sort of like 10 X the money that you thought you needed, what would you do? Yes. So, one thing I probably would do is go to breweries and say, hey, I want to brew a batch and I want to collaborate with you and I'll pay you for it. So it's sort of like contract brewing, sure. but I would just show up. It's kind of like the renting renting the cars, right? I could do the fun stuff and then get out of there. And then I'd have like my, my own label. I'd have my own beer. I could collaborate with the recipe. And I, I mean, I'm I'm actually pretty skilled as a brewer and I understand a lot of the concepts. So, I mean, I would actually be able to work with a brewer without being a, a jerk or anything like that. So that is probably something I'd do. I'd probably travel around and go to like my favorite breweries and say, hey, I'll give you whatever, like 50K, let's brew a batch of beer here. Yeah, that's cool. So when Spotify buys our podcast for multi-millions, uh, yeah, I look forward to it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, honestly, I mean, you may be surprised because I think smaller breweries in small towns would probably do it for a relatively small amount of money because it's tough. It's a tough business. It's a tough business. So if you came in, you may be able to like brew a batch of beer for like a few thousand bucks have your name on the wall for while they're serving it out of the tank. And then you could have Van Halen perform in your backyard. I guess you can't do that anymore. RIP Eddie, but. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. It's rough. So, okay. So talent stacking. And I, I think that the takeaway here is to like, think about your skills and what unique combination you might have. You may have overlooked some interesting things that you have some skills that you have that are really useful. Maybe it's a way you can grow it into a side hustle. Yeah. And the other thing to say is it's okay to pivot too. If you have an idea that doesn't necessarily work out, maybe your blog on on crypto Dogecoin, however the hell you say that doesn't work out, but maybe you decide you want to write about something different or you transfer, I'm not a crypto guy, you go to a different cryptocurrency. It's okay to abandon one idea and jump to something else. Go with the flow and see what works. Uh, if you're not enjoying it or it hasn't accomplished what you thought it would, just stop and do something else. Quitting is really powerful. So I encourage people to stick with, you know, whatever you're starting long enough to like give it a chance, which may be longer than you think. But with the sunk cost fallacy and some of those biases that we have, it's really easy to stick with some projects for longer, even if you're not working on them and they just take up like mental capacity. And I could think of a few websites that I've started that I should have just gotten rid of or just let die. And they're still sitting there and I still think about them once a week. And I'm like, oh, I should really do something with such and such site. And, you know, side story, I had one of those and it was actually a, it was a case study that I was doing for my blog. I was doing this publicly and I kind of, um, I, I did a bad job following through. So I worked on this case study for about six months, had some updates, people were interested in it. And then I just lost interest, got busy with some other stuff, never touched it again. I invested roughly uh, 15,000 into that project and a couple years went by and it was not performing and it was still sitting there. And I thought oh, I should do something with it. And I just, you know, I don't want to take on more projects like I keep saying. So it occurred to me, I should take my own advice and just get rid of it. That thing failed, but there's still some value. So I, I sold it. So okay. I sold it at a loss, like quite a loss. I won't mention how much, but I lost money on the whole thing, but it's a sunk cost, right? And we could do whole episodes on biases and all that stuff. But 
once I got rid of it, I'm like, oh, I don't have to worry about it anymore. And I made a little bit of money back. I spent the 15K like two years ago. It was gone. Like it, it was gone for a long time. So at least I got a few thousand bucks out of it. Sure. Yeah. This conversation reminds me of one of our mutual friends named Matt Giovannici. And he runs a site called Money Lab where he does all these different experiments. And the cool thing is he reports the finances. Like he'll say, I started, I think one of them was a coffee brewer thing. Another one was that he's working on now is home brewing. But he'll say, yeah, I started this up here. I stopped it here. It was a failure. And he'll go into it. He'll discuss why. But the the lesson there is he's not afraid to, he, he's doing things within his own skill level. He's starting new websites. So he's not recreating the wheel every time he's doing stuff within his wheelhouse. But he's pivoting, and when something doesn't work, he quits and goes to something new. And some of it stuck really well. One of his original ones, Swim University, uh, I have a pool in my backyard. And whenever I look up a pool issue, pools always have something fucking going on. I look it up, and, and I see Matt. Oh, there's my neighbor, like, <laughs> talking on talking on YouTube. So, Yeah, yeah. And he shares um, all his stats. So, like, revenue for that site, it makes, like, hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. per year. So, re- really cool. And he's been working at it for a long, long time. So again, like start something. He started that blog in like 2005. Wow. 2005. Yeah. Swim university. And he, he worked at like a pool shop. It's amazing. Yeah. It's okay to quit. It's okay to pivot. And really that's kind of expected. I I would say you should imagine that it's going to be a little bit different once you get started and it's only once you start that you can get the feedback from your audience or whatever mechanism is in place so that you know how to adjust. So funny enough, I haven't thought about it much, but we we are recording. We're getting a few episodes done. We haven't launched this show yet. So I expect we may pivot. Some people may be more interested in certain topics. Maybe they want to see a little bit uh, less of us and more guests which we're going to be getting more guests on. It's all part of the plan. But I mean, we may have to pivot a little bit exactly what we're covering in these shows. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see the feedback. Please be nice. Yeah. Well, you can delete YouTube comments, right? Did you ever do that? Or Yeah, yeah. Sometimes people are just jerks. Okay. So yeah, you do. Uh, especially when they're mean to each other. Uh, like you want to have like a nicer community. If they're mean to me, uh, I don't care. That's fine. Every now and then I'll engage. I'm not as mature as like what you were saying. Like, Hey, I'll help you out. It sounds like you're having a tough time. I'll like, you know, it's my platform. So I'll go, <laughs> I'll go back and, uh, you know, be a little bit of a jerk. I, I know other people read the comments. So I, I try to get the people that are actual, uh, members of the community to laugh. Yeah. So I, really, I just want to make people laugh most of the time. <laughs> and the nice thing is if people are jerks, a lot of times your fans will step up and shoot that person down. So you don't even have to do it yourself. Yeah. 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 All right. And I'm looking at what else we have here. So just, um, I guess there's a few other ideas. Yeah. I think we are going to talk about ideas and what you should actually do. We've been talking about all this shit, how to Start up a side house on why you should, but we haven't actually suggested any ideas except ridiculous ones like PMP brewers. But before we get into some of these ideas, the amazing thing is right now is kind of, it is the golden age of the side hustle, right? Because 50 years ago or 30 years ago, the internet wasn't around. So any side hustle had to be some locally successful thing. But now you've got this thing called the internet, which is this medium that you could potentially reach billions of people. It's so many ideas have sprung from this and there's so many ways to leverage these ideas. Anything you start that's on the internet can reach a ton of people and you don't have to, your audience doesn't have to be the 40,000 people in your town. It's billions of people, no matter how ridiculous and how silly your idea is, it's going to resonate with some of those people. Hopefully they find you. So, uh, I, I don't want to say no idea is too ridiculous because some might actually be too ridiculous, but there's never been a better time to to start a hustle. And we've got some ideas here that the easiest one is probably a, a blog or the most simplest one. Mm-hmm. Start up a blog. You've got some ideas. You want to write about something. You're an expert in some kind of thing like Doug and SEO or me. I'm not an expert in much of anything, but sometimes I can be kind of entertaining. So you cannot know about anything if you're entertaining. You can get someone to, to read your shit. And I always have the 
the, a lot of times people will come to me and say, yeah, I want to start a blog, but I don't really enjoy writing that much. So I'm like, my first question is like, well, why the hell do you want to start a blog? But then uh, the other thought I have is, well, a blog doesn't have to be 800 words every time. It could be random thoughts. You ever read Seth Godin? Mm -hmm. Seth Godin's blog? His blog is like, each post is like eight words long. <laughs> it's a little bit longer than that, but they're very short. They, they're like, uh, you see blogs like this is a 23 minute read and you're like, ah, uh. but, but then his are like a 30 second read. So you could do that. You could show pictures on your blog. You could just have a quote of the day. It can be whatever medium you feel comfortable. Again, don't force it. Find your circles of confidence, that stacking that, that Doug talked about a little bit earlier, and leverage that. And another great one, just like this, is a podcast. Who would want to start that? It is also the golden age for podcasts. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I listen to talk radio when I was probably like middle school and older. And I don't know why I was a weird kid, weird adult. And I like talk radio. So it's cool to have this sort of like radio show resurgence, especially it's easy for anyone, like literally anyone can start a podcast. There's some free platforms out there that uh, I don't know how they monetize exactly, but um, you don't even have to pay for like the, the podcast hosting. So I think it's fantastic. And to your point, if, if someone doesn't like to write, but they like to talk, the podcast is perfect. Yeah. That's, it's interesting, Doug, that you mentioned the talk radio. I was thinking the other day, and my thought was for anyone under the age of like, I don't know, 60, 65, podcasts are the new talk radio because you can listen to what you want, when you want. And I think probably most talk radio formats are published as a podcast now. And I'd be curious to know what percentage of their listenership is the on-demand, the podcast format versus tune in at 3 p.m. Like, who has time for that? You're always doing some other shit or your your kids are beating each other at the time. So, okay, kids, I'm going to pause this and I'll separate your fight. So, yeah, podcasts are, are, are the new talk radio and, a, uh, yeah, a, a great medium. Mm -hmm. And then next, and I think maybe one of the best ones is YouTube. So, I mean – I have a YouTube channel. We're publishing this on YouTube as well. And I think, you know, one of the great things with YouTube is so far, it is probably the cheapest one to get started. You don't have to pay for hosting. You probably have a smartphone in your pocket that can shoot HD. Audio quality is going to be good enough. And there's a huge audience on YouTube. It's there for you. With the other things that we mentioned, podcast and a blog, there's not an embedded audience waiting for you right there. With YouTube, they're just sitting there waiting to, to yeah. watch your videos. And it's easier to find stuff too. So if I want to learn more about Tesla, I can go on YouTube.com and punch in Tesla. I'm not, I'm sure iTunes probably has some search functionality, but I wonder how many people know about that. YouTube is easy and it's conducive to finding content. And also YouTube will lead you to the best content. Your video will end and then it'll show you another video automatically. So YouTube is a, yeah, YouTube is a great medium. The other thing I want to say about YouTube is I was at a conference a couple of years ago and, and someone got on stage and he was actually comparing blogs to podcasts to YouTube. And he's like, well, he started talking about blogging and he's like, oh, there's, there's a million blogs. There's just, there's tons of them. So you can do that, but it might be better to do a podcast because there's a little bit higher barrier of, of entry in that you have to have the, the, the technical setup. It's a little bit more difficult to figure out how to upload it. And a lot of people are just shy about hearing their own voice and doing that part, or they're shy about not being good on audio. Uh, looking at myself here. <laughs> but then he went on to say that YouTube trumps podcasts because you've got a whole, uh, a whole different barrier of entry in that you're actually showing your face on the screen. <laughs> and people are shy about that. It's a little bit more technical and it's Definitely. I mean, clear, clearly it's not anonymous and it's also, it's like the wide open West. There's a lot less people doing it. So there's lots more opportunity if you can find a niche you're good at. So yeah, YouTube is great. I would, if I was advising anyone that wanted to get information out, I would always tell them to focus on YouTube. Yep. And great skills. It's a little more complex. You will have to hopefully create something entertaining. That's the challenging part with YouTube there are so many distractions and other little suggestions popping up anytime someone is watching a video. It's hard to get someone to watch past a few minutes where 
the advantage with podcast is someone starts listening and as long as you don't screw up really, really bad, they will probably listen to like 80 to 90% of the episode or, or more. I mean, I listen to like 99% of most podcasts that I listen to. So YouTube is, is a little challenging, but it, it forces you to learn how to present and be a little more entertaining. Yep. Okay. Our next idea is sell a product. And there's a million different ways to do this. And a lot of these were kind of the original sites on the internet. eBay will get on there and sell your own crap. But now you could do other things like sell a course, which you do, Doug, right? You? I do. Yeah. I have a few courses out there. I think I have five total. And like, like we keep saying, you learn new things. So I learned about email marketing, copywriting, creating sales pages, creating a curriculum and presenting a course that has enough information, but not too much, right? You, you don't actually want to enroll in a course that's going to take you forever and be really hard to implement because there's just so much information. So it was a whole other learning experience. The good part is it's a digital product. And once you create it, you can sell it over and over again. And it doesn't matter if you sell you know, 10 of them or 50,000 of them. Like it's pretty much the same delivery cost. So it scales in a way that many other things can't. So really profitable. And I mean, it's not easy by any stretch. It's easy to get started. Like it's easy to get started uh, with a blog or YouTube or whatever, but to, to really do a good job, it takes some time. Cool. Yeah. Another one we have down here is Amazon fulfillment. And I'm not sure if fulfillment is the correct word, but the example I was thinking of, Doug, is there's actually someone we know at the HQ, our co-working space, who makes a product in China and has it shipped to Amazon fulfillment centers, and then it's sold on Amazon. So he never even sees the actual product. He doesn't have to deal with boxes in his basement or a warehouse or shipping labels. It just goes directly from where it's made to the shipping center, and then he uses Amazon, obviously, to get rid of the product. Uh, there's another person at the co-working space who, who does this with clothes. He has a team of people who... He sends to thrift shops, they know what kind of clothes to look for, and then he resells them. But I don't think he sees much of the product either, although he is obviously more involved in day-to-day because -day he's out there finding the physical product. And he makes a, a lot of money doing this, all leveraging these internet sites that weren't around two decades ago. That's pretty cool. I'll have to have him on my other podcast. That sounds perfect. I, I didn't know that person existed. So, cool. And uh, another one we have listed here is Etsy. And I think, I mean, there's tons of stuff you could do there. I think I've seen a lot of printable stuff here recently, but do you know anything else about Etsy? Well, another interesting story, another person from the HQ, his, his daughter figured out that people are willing to make, a, willing to pay a lot of money for a hobby horse. So my first question is what the hell is a hobby horse? Do you know what a hobby horse is, Doug? Never heard of it. <laughs> it's these things you probably saw this as a kid. It's like a horse head on a stick, and I think it started out as like a kid's toy where you'd, you, like a broomstick, you'd you'd run around on this horse head on a stick. <laughs> Seems weird. Toys toys have definitely evolved, but it turns out people collect these things, and people will pay hundreds of dollars for high end versions of these things, and they'll also I mean talk about a niche product. They'll also pay for accessories. So, for example, the one he told me about was a bridal veil. People. Well, buy a hobby horse. I can't believe these words are coming out of my mouth. And then people will buy a bridal veil for their hobby horse and use these for like bachelorette parties and shit like that. So his daughter is, is a young teen, started a hobby horse business. She makes these things in her garage. I'm like, how much does she get for these things? And he's like, yeah, 65 to $135. I don't know about you, Doug, but when I was her age, I was working at McDonald's making three thirty five dollars an hour. That was minimum wage. She's in her garage making these fake horse things and selling them on Etsy. Like, she's got her shit figured out. Like, it sounds a lot wow. better than working in fast food. Wow. Yeah, I didn't even know those existed, or or that there was a market. I, I I've seen those uh, horse head, whatever broomstick things, but yeah, crazy. Yeah. So there's there's stuff out there that you didn't even know people were paying money for. 
Wow. That's wow. crazy. Doug, your birthday is coming. I, I see a hobby <laughs> horse in your future. Yeah. Georgie, my dog, would love it. Drag that thing around. All right. You can also write a book. You can write a book, which would be a, a bigger endeavor, but that is attainable now. You can self-publish a book very easily. It used to be so hard to get a book published. So, Yeah, the platform is there. And the way to market is there. You you write a book. Hey, now I'm going to start a podcast or produce YouTube videos where I talk about the book. Or I'll sign up for Doug's course. I'll hit him, learn about the golden ratio, and learn about SEO so I could sell my book. The most successful example I could think of this is going to be our first or second guest on the show, who's J.L. Collins, who wrote The Simple Path to Wealth. He self-published that book, and he's sold hundreds of thousands of copies, of, which is amazing. So he wrote this thing himself. He had help. He worked with an editor, but... No publishing house. He completely bypassed that. Granted, most people don't have that level of success, but this is something you could do with minimal expenditure. And if you like to write, it just might be the, the thing for you. What would you write a book about if you had to write 100,000 words? Oh, gosh. I, I would probably do some sort of a uh, sort of a, a travel log sort of thing and have some sort of theme, probably beer and food. I could imagine, I mean, that's how I, I want to do my road trips anyway, like hit breweries, have good food. And I think that could be fun to write about and maybe, you know, go on a road trip. I, I drove to Alaska a couple of years ago. I think that would be perfect to, you know, drive, visit places across the country or countries and uh, drink some beer along the way. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I would like to actually, uh, I would buy that book, Doug. If, if you write it, I will buy it. So you've got one sold. And I'll give away two on the blog and a giveaway, so three. <laughs> Very good. And last one, and this is something that you've already started, right, Carl? I, I have already started this. I've got <laughs> negative subscribers to it. But yeah, Doug, I was reading about this, and I think you mentioned it a couple podcasts ago, this show. I, I haven't done a lot of research on it, so I hope this isn't. Well, I, I'll just say what it is. Only fans. So people, and it seems from what I've seen so far, mostly women, sell pictures of themselves online. And I think they're probably compromising pictures. So I would not recommend this side hustle to anyone. But it just demonstrates how many different ways there are to sell and possibly to sell out on the Internet. Doug, right. do you have an OnlyFans site yet? Or? I, I don't, but, you know, I'm open to it. And I was going to say if um... – if that is the side hustle for you, you know, I don't judge. I mean, if you want to do an OnlyFans page, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a good punchline. I've used it as a joke several times, and it's usually a big hit whenever I say it because people are like, oh, well, did, did he just say that in kind, uh, you know, respectful company here? <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, so OnlyFans, and I think it's, um, I mean, it could be for for any gender, and I think like, non-adult entertainment um like you can connect with your fans like the idea is you cut out the uh industry middlemen who are skimming off the top and you can connect with your fans directly so let's say you have an instagram carl where you know you wear uh, mesh tank tops or you know what whatever kind of whatever kind of thing i mean I don't care if if you like the mesh tank tops, that's cool with me. And then you want to connect deeper with um, your fans. You want to give them different content, whatever it may be. And it's behind a paywall and you get paid directly from your fans. So, I mean, you, you it could be anything back there. Um, it could be the, you know, adult oriented videos, or it could be um, like meetups where you're, you do a live stream and you chat with your fans directly. So you could also do this on Patreon or something, something like that too. There's other options to connect with your fans directly, but it's a great mechanism and it's, you know, it goes to show you can start any one of the things we mentioned and then bring people over to a platform that you own instead of, you know, one of the flaws would say TikTok or Instagram or a Facebook page or a Facebook group is you're building on their platform and they could change the rules on you and you, you can't do anything about it. So on Instagram and, and Facebook, they've changed the algorithm multiple times. And if someone built a business on 
basically like quote rented land, then you can't do anything about it. So, but if you could bring them over to OnlyFans or Patreon or whatever, then you can connect directly with your crew. Uh, so I have two follow up questions. Do you have any idea what what cut does OnlyFans take? I wonder. I I'm not sure. I would suspect it's like probably like what's the app stores are usually thirty percent. I would suppose something around that but yeah something and, and i know i've checked patreon before and i want to say theirs was around 10 percent. they really put the uh creators out front it, it was created by you know someone in that position but you know i have my my own platform elsewhere and i was like i don't even want to give 10 percent to another platform if i can do it myself so sure it is cool. Patreon's pretty neat. One of my favorite podcasts is about Tesla and the guy was able to quit his job and makes all his money. It's called the Tesla Daily Podcast, just from Patreon supporters. He used to announce them at the end of the show and there were so many he couldn't it would take him I don't know what he said, like half an hour to read everyone. But what a great thing that is. And he said only two percent of people who listen to it contribute, but just that is enough for him to do this commercial free thing, no commercials, just provide good information and then two percent of his community supports them and that's it so yet another way to make money from your side business but my other follow-up doug what i wanted to say is i have never owned a mesh tank top but if you would like to wear yours to our upcoming memorial day pool party i (laughs) I won't judge that much uh maybe we can get mile high phi podcast mesh tank tops that we could wear to events (laughs) it it, (laughs) And then we could sell. We might sell like we'll sell a negative amount. This no, this this is pro. This is not a good side hustle. Yeah. Are Are you saying sell the ones that we have worn? Like you think those are going to be worth more than the? Uh... <laughs> I think I think so too. I think so too. I like where your head's going. If a zombie apocalypse happens and people need to like set materials on fire to keep warm, maybe then they would have some value. Or maybe when you're done, even to. Like I'm thinking I always get my old ratty shirts when I'm changing my oil to clean up with, but a mesh isn't going to provide the surface area needed to clean up my oil spills in the garage. So That's true, but our intense mile-high sun that we get here in Longmont, you know, we want to have that breathability that only mesh can provide. Now, I, I wonder if other people think this is funny or... I don't know. I'm just curious what people think. So do send us an email, um, sign up for the email list, the Mile High Fight Club, and let us know. Are, are we are we funny or is this dumb? <laughs> I suspect we'll have a mix of both there, Doug, if, if anyone is still listening at this, at this point. Right. Honey, turn off. Turn this off. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the cool part, it, actually, to be meta, and and then we'll, we'll we'll close her out here. But the interesting thing is, you can just be uh, yourselves, no matter how embarrassing that is to even ourselves and to our spouses. But you can just be yourself, and there's some subset of people that will have the same warped sense of humor, and they want to talk about finances, they want to talk about beer, and they're into the whole, they're into the whole package. They like our stupid jokes. It's, tr- it's weird. Yeah, it is weird. I'm, I'm trying to think where the Venn diagram overlap of a mesh tank top comes. That thing is going to be burned into my brain all day, dog. I, I can't get rid of it. Like, it's when you try to think about something else and what you're trying not to think about just surfaces to the top of your brain. And dog, you've, I wouldn't say ruined my day. That'd be too harsh. But you've, you've altered my day in a way that I, I would not wish it to be altered. Yeah, it, now it's burned into my brain. We're just going to be thinking mesh mesh tank tops. It's going to be a thing. I, I think we're we're going to have to at least wear it over our clothes at FinCon. Oh, if if we do have a store, I I pranked the mad scientist one time because he sells shirts, and I'm like, you should sell a thong, like some thong underwear. And he's got his logo is a little Erlenmeyer flask, so I actually mocked one up like a a thong with an Erlenmeyer <laughs> flask and. I was hoping he would take my idea and run with it. And he never did. But building on that, if we ever do own a store and if someone is desperate enough to have to buy articles of clothing from us, I will. We will. I wonder if any online things like can you, Redbubble, do they do a mesh tank top? I don't know, Doug, but I'm going to certainly we're gonna, find out. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to be doing uh, a lot of searches. And I like the thong idea. I mean, I can imagine at the conferences, you know, people will be flashing them at us as we're you know, late night having drinks or whatever. And I know for a fact that 
they do do thongs. Can you imagine that intimate situation? Like, hey, honey, what's that on your on your underwear? Oh, it's the Mad Scientist Erlenmeyer flask, or it's the what is the Mile High Phi Club? Like, <laughs> yeah, it, it, this is a weird note to end on, but I think it's time to go. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah, let's uh, let's cut our losses right now. <laughs> Cut the losses of the audience. All right. Well, do send us an email. Start something, whatever your medium is, you know, get into it. The time to start is yesterday. And if you didn't start yesterday, think about it for today. Yeah. I can't top that. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, man. We'll see you guys on the next one.